So, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, this is going to be a talk on uh, Christian spirituality and prayer. What is prayer? Why do we pray? Um, I think most people know why we pray, right? Why do we pray? Does anyone know why we pray? Do we know why we pray? To win the lottery? To win the lottery? That's a good, yeah, that's a start to get something out of it. To get strength. Okay. All right. I got the answers here. You're not, you know, I mean, you're not going to be able to give me the, the proper answer, I guess. But maybe you would. Um, well, basically, in the section, the fourth uh, section of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they talk about Christian prayer. And I, and I want to, uh, the section on the Christian prayer is a summary of the entire catechism. And, and so the first paragraph of the section says, great is the mystery of, of the faith. So it, obviously prayer has to do with faith. Okay, so the church professes uh, this mystery in the Apostles' Creed. So the faith that we profess, so that's the first section of the, of the uh, catechism. It talks about the sections of the creed, which I think you've covered some of those things already. Then we also see not only is it professed, but it is celebrated in the sacramental liturgy when we talk about the sacraments. Okay? So we profess it, we celebrate it, and then we begin living it, and that's the third part um, in the areas of following the commandments and things like that. The, but lastly, it says this mystery, the mystery of faith that is great, then requires that the faithful believe in it, the creed, celebrate it, the liturgy, and they live it from uh, they live from it in the moral life in a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. That's the purpose of prayer: to form that vital and personal relationship with our God. That's why we pray. Sure, we ask for things. Sure, it gives us strength and comfort. But ultimately, it's to establish that relationship with our Creator. The, uh, right after this, uh, this statement about how, a relation, how this relationship is prayer, this personal and vital relationship with the living and true God, they quote um, the little flower, St. Therese of, of Lisieux, and she says this about prayer. She says, For me... Prayer is the surge of the heart. It's the surge of the heart. It is a simple look toward, uh, toward heaven. It is a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. It's a longing of our heart. We allow it to rise up to God. Think about when, when we have just a personal relationship with one another. As that relationship grows, our heart longs sometimes to be with that individual, especially as, you know, for couples preparing for marriage or as they grow in love in that unique way, but just also in just a, a, a friendship. We long to be with people. We long to be with our family, our friends. Our heart, you know, desires for that, longs for that. And in that, in that relationship that's formed, we grow together through that simple look towards each other when we start communicating. We start talking. But as we know, in any type of personal relationship, right, you can't do all the talking. And that's one of the mistakes in prayer. We often think, well, I just got to keep talking because I'm a little uncomfortable. You know, we're sitting down. Can you stay with me? Yeah. <laughs> you're sitting down like this or kneeling and you're like, okay, Lord, I just want this and that and thank you for that. And, you know, um, just having a rough time and all this kind of stuff. All right, that was good. <laughs> Did we give any time for our Lord to speak to us as our heart rises up to Him? And that communication, that personal vital relationship with Him, have we allowed Him to speak to us in the depths of our being? And that's prayer. 
that communication. As we see in St. John Damascene, he says, as this section in prayer continues in the second paragraph of this section four, he says, he wrote, that prayer is the rising of one's mind and heart to God or, or the requesting of good things from God. But when we pray, do we speak from the height of our pride and will or out of the depths of a humble and contrite heart? And so it's not a matter of just asking God for things that we want. It's not a matter of, as we see in Scripture, um, with the, uh, the scribe or the Pharisee, the, the religious person that was outside, you know, outside the temple and says, Lord, thank you for making me just completely awesome and being a great leader and knowing all these great things and so forth, right? Versus the one that was a sinner saying, have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. And that true humility. And that must be included in any type of relationship. When pride gets in the way of relationships, those relationships usually, on a human level, start separating, do they not? And so, too, with our relationship with God. Pride, we need to be humble in this. We need to recognize our place before the Creator. You know, even more so than, than on the human level, because He is our Creator. He made us, and He longs for us to be with Him, and that's why that desire is within us, you know? Um, deep down inside from the heart. Um, as St. Augustine would write in his confessions, at the very beginning of his confessions, as he, uh, St. Augustine, who was seeking for truth throughout the duration of his, of his uh, youth and was questioning, it was ridiculed the Catholic faith um, and was getting in all types of different philosophies. Well, when he eventually came to recognize uh, the truth and where the truth lied, where it was in the church. He, wrote this, he writes this book called The Confessions, which is his own confessions about how far away he was from God. And the very beginning of that, he says, My heart is restless until it rests in you, O Lord. Our heart longs to be with the Lord, and that's what prayer is, that desire to be with Him and then be in that intimate relationship with God. That's where we're going to find that true happiness. This is where we see in the section uh, of the Catechism, um, it talks about how this prayer is present from the very beginning, how God is with His people, and this prayer is initiated with God coming to us first giving us that longing in the depths of our heart. As we, as we continue in this section of the Catechism, it says, In the Old Testament, the revelation of prayer comes between the fall and the restoration of man, that is, between God's sorrowful call to His first children. Remember when they fell, what happened? What did they say? What did God say to, to Adam and Eve? Where are you? <laughs> no, I think God heard a similar sound, actually, when, when he asked that question. Where are you? And he just heard crickets or something. Right? So he asked them, where are you? Here he had created Adam and Eve for that very intimate relationship with him. And through their own pridefulness, they turn away from God, hide from Him. And yet, he, here He is initiating that relationship once again, even after they've fallen. He says, where are you? What is it that you have done? Right? And the response of God's only Son on coming into the world as we continue this, Lo, I have come to do your will, O God shows that prayer is bound up in the human history. From the moment of creation when God initiates that prayer and desires that relationship, throughout the covenants of the Old Testament that He established, His desire to be in communion with us, finding its fulfillment in Christ who came and took flesh, uniting us back to the Father. And so because of this, because of these God's promise and, and the various... Um, 
the, the, the promises that are ultimately fulfilled in Christ and that desire to be in relationship with us, to be in communion with us, right, is the source of prayer. And so if we skip along for those who have their catechism, we see that in the fullness of time, in paragraph 2598, okay, this is the second article under the section of prayer, we say that the drama of prayer is fully revealed to us in the Word when it became, when who became flesh and dwell, uh, dwells among us, to seek to understand his prayer through what he witnessed, through what, through what his witnesses proclaim to us in the gospel, is, in a, is to approach the Holy Lord Jesus as Moses approached the burning bush. First to contemplate him in prayer, then to hear how he teaches us to pray in order to know how he hears our prayer. Again, Jesus comes and says, I'm drawing you all back to, to God, to me. You know, I thirst for you, as he says on the cross. That's why when he was teaching, doing all these great things, what did the apostles ask? Master, teach us how to pray. Here's the new Adam teaching us how to pray in a way that the old Adam, the, the first Adam, failed to do when he hid himself. And Jesus tells us this is the formula. This is how we pray. We see throughout the Scriptures several times uh, our Lord going into the wilderness to pray, going into uh, the, the, those periods of time when He would go up a mountain in solitude to pray, reflecting on certain things. After the death of His own cousin, John, what did He do? He broke away from the people desiring to be in solitude to pray. And because the people didn't understand this, they decided to beat him over to the other side, right? And then he looks upon them and says, he has great compassion and said they were like sheep without a shepherd. He ministers to them, feeds them, sends his disciples away in the boat, sends the, dismisses the people, goes up the mountain and prays. And about the third or fourth watch in the night, he begins walking on the water because of the storm and all that. But he spent time praying. What did he do right before his own passion, his suffering? He was praying in humility, falling to his knees, praying, saying, not my will, but your will, giving us the example. And that's, that's exactly what prayer, how prayer must be approached and how we must pray, following the example of how Jesus taught us. Um, as we see uh, in this in the Catechism, as it goes through it, it tells us there are various forms of prayer, prayer of petition. Um, that's one of the, you know, we, that's the easiest, I think, for most of us. Lord, I need this, 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 right? Or I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. It's the easiest one for us to get. I don't think anyone, no matter what your faith background is, when you found, when you found God, that's the easiest one for any of us. Because it's the most childlike. Think of a little child. I want it, I want it, I want it, right? <laughs> you just have to take a child through the uh, checkout lane in the grocery store, and you'll understand what I mean, because that's exactly how we are sometimes before God. But then we also have another prayer, which is a prayer of petition in a sense, but it's called the prayer of intercession, when we intercede for others. And we can think about this. Think about the times that maybe someone asks you to say a prayer for them, or the times we've asked other people to pray for us. Hey, I'm about to, I'm about to go for this interview for a job. I'm about to take a test of some sort. And what do we do? Hey, can you pray for me? But in the Catholic Church, this prayer of intercession is not limited to the church militant, those here on earth, but goes beyond, goes to the church triumphant, those that have been examples of the faith. And so we ask them to teach us, right, to help us along this way. I just want to read it, uh, what would be a prayer of intercession to a saint, a saint that we just celebrated uh, his life, St. Paul the Cross. Listen to this prayer. 
says, Father, you gave your priest, St. Paul, a special love for the cross of Christ. May his example inspire us to embrace our own cross with courage. So here we are, we have a prayer that's directed to the Father. We're not praying to the saint. We're recognizing what God did in this saint's life, and then we're asking God for the strength through the intercession of this saint to have a similar, uh, to be inspired by his example to embrace our cross with such courage as he did. And then ultimately, we ask this to be granted through Christ, the Son who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's how the church prays to the, uh, through the saints, asking them to intercede for us. It's not a praying to them. It's like they are, um, I once heard a, uh, someone speaking about this, and they said it, um, going through the saints, would be like going uh, to someone in your life that you really respect uh, religiously. Think about it. You admire them. You're like, that's a holy person. They really understand what it means to be Christian. And I need a little extra prayer at this point in my life. I'm suffering from this or that. I just experienced this, you know, a death in the family or um, I got the news that I have cancer or something like that. I need some extra prayers because I can't do it by myself. I'm going to go to this person I recognize as living a holy life. And that's what the saints are. They already showed us the example. And we're asking them. And that's why we have all these saints uh, that are patron saints of particular things. Why? Because they experience similar things. I always look at uh, an example um, of this would be not only Paul, St. Paul of the Cross, but we have like St. Lucy in December, we'll be celebrating her. She had her eyes plucked out because she would not deny her faith. So guess what she's the patron saint of? <laughs> so if you have problems with your eyes, you prayed through her because she had them completely taken out. According to the, uh, her story, um, not only did, they, did she have them plucked out, but the next day they were back in. I don't know. I wasn't there. The whole point is she did not deny her faith. She had strength, even though her eyes were taken out. And though when we might be having problems with our own eyesight, we pray to her that we might not lose the sight of faith. Right? We pray through her intercession to God our Father for this to be granted. As we continue to read, there's also a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer of praise. To give thanks right before we eat dinner. To give thanks after we eat dinner or after any meal. Uh, to give thanks for good things and bad things that happen in our life. It's easier for the good things. You know, Something, if something great happens, you get promoted at work or something, you're like, thank you, God. But how many of us, when we experience something of that entails suffering, do we say, thank you, God, for this moment to participate in your own suffering? That's the challenge. There's a prayer of praise giving praise to God, right? For who He is and the life that He has given us. That's an easy one too. I think really when it comes down to it, the prayer of thanksgiving fully lived out is the most difficult to thank God. Or maybe even praise, even when we're facing suffering too. To praise God even in the midst instead of saying, where are you God? Why have you abandoned me? but to give him praise. The psalm that Jesus recites on the, on the cross, my Lord, my, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Is not a prayer of despair, but rather a prayer of praise. If we know that psalm, it begins like that, but goes through praising God for all that he has done for his people. 
And so Christ quoting that in the middle, it, as he's affixed on the cross, in the, that suffering, says this to the, those watching and says, oh, look, you know, he's given up. <laughs> but it had such great, moral, it had a much greater purpose in the sense that he's giving praise to God in that, in that simple quote. Yeah, he said, why, why have you forsaken me? Oh, well, you really haven't because you've been with your people. And you've shown the depth of that love as that it's being shown through me as I die on the cross. Ultimately, uh, prayer, I'm going to go back a little in the catechism. I think I, I skipped by it early. I think it was early on. Gotta find it. Is everyone with me so far? It's pretty easy. I, mean, I think most of us know how to, I hope most of us know how to pray. I don't know. I could be wrong. It's doing it. It's doing it. Right. Knowing is one thing. That's why I think St. John Damascene says it, you know, with the mind and the heart. So I think in the mind is how we know it, know how to do it, but then the heart is actually the living and doing it. Um, shoot, I. I Trying to find it. Yeah, can't find it. I knew I, I knew I should have circled it. Uh, what song are you referencing just now? Uh, Psalm 20, 23, 22. Yeah. 22, I think. 22, 23. The Psalms are all messed up because of the different translations. So, I get them mixed up. Hi, camera. I get them mixed up. <laughs> it's 22, and I think in some places it's 23. That's why I said. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I, I was, thought I was going back, but then I, I've, it's actually going forward. Um, in the uh, under paragraphs, 2663, it's a, uh, there's different ways um, of praying. And uh, well, the, the next paragraph following says that there is no other way of Christian prayer than Christ. Whether our prayer is communal or personal, vocal or interior, it has access to the Father only if we pray in the name of Jesus. Only if we pray in the name of Jesus. But again, you might say, well, what about the prayer to the saint? Well, we're not praying to the saint. What about the prayers to Mary? We're not praying to Mary. But we're praying in the name of the Son. Again, that, that prayer. And if you listen at Mass, you'll hear the, um, the same prayers. But listen, at the end of a prayer, we always say, we always begin with the prayers usually with Father, and then we end the prayers with grant this through Christ our Lord, so in his name, grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Every, <laughs> amen, all the prayers are in the name of Jesus through which we have the access. But the prayers that we um, have with, uh, that we are Marian prayers are the prayers that we pray with Mary Going, going to uh, the, uh, going to the, to the, through the Son to the Father. So in this, it says all the all prayers ultimately are going to Jesus. All prayers are going to Jesus. However, in prayer, the Holy Spirit unites us to the person of the only Son, Jesus, in His glorified humanity through which and in which our filial prayers unites us, unites us in the church with the mother of Jesus. So we are united with her. And a really good thing about um, understanding like the prayers that we pray, like the Hail Mary or things, the, the, the prayers uh, that we pray, in a, and for lack of a better word, to Mary, but it's really not to Mary, it's to our Lord, um, are those prayers that... Uh, St. Louis de Montfort would say, um, um, I just lost the bottom, uh, would be 
um, to Jesus through Mary. To Jesus through Mary. And if we understand, to help understand this, we have to understand the Old Testament a bit. And the kingdom established, the Davidic kingdom. David had a son. His name was Solomon, right? Solomon was a very wise man, but even for his own relatives to approach and ask Solomon for a favor, nine out of ten times, they would go through the queen mother. Not because they were afraid of the king. Not because they had, that he would deny their request. But they knew that the queen mother had a little, little influence. Right? Because what son does not listen to his mother? Well, there, there are quite a few, but, you know. <laughs> it tugs at the heart even when they're not listening. Okay, mom, fine. I'll do it. I mean, I have no, I, I can think of this when, um, and I've said this before, just in my own life as a priest, going back home, and my mom still says, hey, it's time to pray. And I'm like, hello, I'm a priest. And she's, you know, she'll say, get in there right now, all the more reason for you to pray. And I'm like, okay, thank you. You know, all right, mom, I'll listen to you. And so we go in prayer to Jesus through Mary. I also, uh, to help kids understand this, I think it's a, maybe a little easier for, for guys because of, I, don't, I mean, I don't know, I might be, that might be a mistake, but I, I just notice in my own family, whenever we want a dad to allow a, us to do something, all my brothers, and, and I was included in that, would go to mom, say, hey, mom, could you ask Dad if we could go to this place or that place and take the car? Sure, dear. She would go, and then he would come back, and he'd be like, and she would say, your father said yes, but you have to be back by this time. Could you ask him if we could be back an hour later? Okay. And she was the you know, messenger. We found it easy. Now, my sister would go directly to, to, um, to my dad. Um, you know, so that's why I just said it's probably easier for guys. I don't know. Um, but, but you see the point of the relationship we have uh, with, with the Blessed Mother in the church, with the saints, and how they're included in the prayer, the life of the prayer of the church. We're not praying to them. We're not worshiping them. All worship, all praise, all thanksgiving goes to God alone, through Jesus, in the name of Jesus. But they're with us. They're praying with us. They're the examples. That's why we also pray for the souls in purgatory. That, that where those that were not had uh, sinned and had reconciled and yet still had uh, traces. The best way I, to quickly describe purgatory, I do this with the kids. I'm like, purgatory is like time out. God, God, you know, God who is Father loves you still as parents love their children but there's still going to be some punishment. And so it's that period of time that you're in time out until you can be welcomed like back in their presence. This love is still there, but you have to spend that time. You know, and uh, so that's kind of what purgatory is, but we pray for, or we pray for the souls in purgatory that that time might be lessened. We're like the, the son, the brothers uh, or sisters of that person in time out, of our sibling in time out, saying, Mom, it was really kind of partly my fault, so could you just let them out, you know, you know, a little early, because we want to play and we want to have fun and we want to be just like dwelling in your presence in, the, in that love. And, and so that's kind of, or we could have the evil sibling who doesn't pray for us and says, keep them there longer, see? That's why we pray. We want to be those good siblings that say, all right, we'll pray for our brothers and sisters in purgatory. And so we pray in communion with our mother, uh, uh, Mary. All right, so there's, there's various forms of prayer. Uh, the, uh, one of the, outside of the sacraments, the liturgy as a prayer, outside of, Reading scripture, which is a prayer. It's not a book, just a, just a book that I'm reading. 
Yeah, I read another book today. Mm -hmm. We, when we read Scripture, we enter it into it. We're supposed to be entering into it as a prayer. Why? Because, again, prayer is that surging of the heart and that vital and personal uh, relationship with God. And this tells us of that relationship. It's God speaking to us. So when we're reading, we're really listening. What is He saying? What is He saying to me? How do I see His love in this? How do I understand the depth of that love? Another form of, of prayer outside of those would be the, what's called the Liturgy of the Hours, which is this little book here, that priests and religious pray. It has a history that goes back to the Israelites, back when they would pray the Psalms. And then in the, uh, after Christ took really form with the, uh, with the monks, and the, uh, the hermits out in the desert and stuff, they took the psalms and began praying them at certain hours of the day and, and thus gave it a little more structure. And or originally, the, uh, the Benedictine monks, they would pray all the psalms in a, in a period of one week. They'd pray the psalms in the period of one week. Some, some Benedictines still do that, but very few. <laughs> it was restructured, and now it's in a four-week period, you pray all the psalms if you pray this. And it has various times to pray. It has uh, the first office is called, uh, is called the office of readings, and then it has morning prayer, which you, office of readings you pray at any time, preferably in the morning, because that's when we're most attentive, because it, it has longer psalms and, and readings uh, from Scripture. The morning prayer we pray in the morning. Mid-morning prayer, mid-morning. Midday, midday. Mid-afternoon, afternoon, evening, evening, night, night. It, we, the church makes it very simple for the priest, you, you know, and the religious. Uh, what do, when do I pray evening prayer again? Hmm. <laughs> right? Tomorrow morning. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they're just very beautiful prayers. And, and all of them, with the exception of night prayer, which night prayer is usually just one psalm, all of them are either one psalm broken into three sections, if it's a longer psalm, or it, it could be two psalms and then some other like canticle, which would have been uh, in the Old Testament or possibly in the New Testament, that uh, with the canticle would be those uh, believed to be those early Christian or Israelite like hymns that would, were very similar to the psalms. And so they, they were inc they're included in here. And then after you pray those psalms or sing them, you have a reading from sacred scripture as if you weren't already reading enough, right? And then, and then, you, then you have, uh, in morning prayer, you have a canticle of Zechariah, which was that, that prayer, that, that song he sung when, he heard, when, he, when his mouth was open upon naming John, John, and he came out and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, right? And he started singing that. And then they, at the evening prayer, we sing the Canticle of Mary. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So we begin singing that. Um, and, and then we end with, uh, with the morning and evening prayer. There's, there's intercessions, okay? An Our Father and a closing prayer. And uh, so this is a very wonderful thing. And, and the way it's set up is... Uh, just to think about this, this is being prayed throughout the course of the day in the life of priests, religious, and laity. And so if it's being prayed across the world, that means at every hour, if it's being prayed as it ought to, there are prayers going up to God on behalf of the people, on behalf of others. Making that little sacrifice. I recommend not necessarily praying the whole thing. I mean, my, my two brothers who were studying to be priests, they were both very comfortable with this. They got, they, when they married, they realized they, they wanted to keep praying this, but they said they didn't have enough time. 
And so they kind of do their own uh, abbreviated form of it. And, uh, but they wish they had more time to do it because it's very enriching. Other forms of prayer that we see, um, we know we have uh, things like the, uh, the rosary or various cha chaplet um, to, uh, for different novenas and, and devotionals there. There's the sporadic prayer, things that we just come up with on our own, right? And there's prayers that are uh, just the simple prayer of the sign of the cross, reminding us of Christ and the cross, you know, Him dying on the cross but how this shows us the Trinitarian love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, there's there's uh, prayers before meals, after meals. There's prayers that we can say when we're cleaning the house, doing work at, you know, at the computer or wherever we might find ourselves working, and, and, and all, these, all these kind of prayers. Um, there are various types of prayers other than, like, not just in, in, in the forms. There's the vocal prayer. That's the one we do most often, <laughs> but it's kind of the least <laughs> important, right? It's important, don't get me wrong, but it's the one where we're doing all the talking. And then from the vocal prayer, okay, signs of a vocal prayer, Hail Mary, Glory be in our Father, or um, thank you Lord for this day, <laughs> or things that we make up, those are, those are the vocal prayers. From this vocal prayer, we must necessarily strive to, uh, that should lead us into what's called meditation. Okay. And I'm not talking about holding your hands out like, like so, and mm, okay. Not like that. A way to kind of maybe understand meditation is as we begin that vocal prayer to God, a good place to begin that vocal prayer is through Scripture. That's why the rosary is really, is really a good uh, way of entering into prayer. Why? It starts with the vocal, but then goes into a mystery of Christ that we find in Scripture. Goes into that mystery in which we are to meditate on. And if we stop praying, let's say, well, I've got to get through these Hail Marys because that finishes the mystery. If we stop and we just meditate on that, on that mystery, to put ourselves in that mystery, St. Ignatius of Loyola would say to meditate would be to put yourself in the scene itself. So let's, if you read Scripture and you put yourself in the scene, I'm just going to pull, let's see, what reading do we want? Try to pick a good one, as if there's bad ones in here, right? No, one of my, one of my favorite that I, con that I often go back to and, and put myself in, um, as they were... Uh, this is right after the, break, the multiplication of the loaves and the, Jesus dismisses the people and so forth. And uh, they go into the, uh, the, the apostles are in the, uh, in the boat along the sea and, and they are, they're being beaten by the, wa the waves. And the disciples saw uh, Jesus walking, saw him walking on the, sh on the sea and they were terrified. It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear, but immediately he spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O man of little faith, why did you doubt? And as you meditate upon this prayer, where are you? Are you in the boat, still afraid? What, are the, what do the waves feel like as they beat that boat? What's going on in, in your life when you see Christ walking across and you hear those words, take heart? Why are you still afraid? 
And then we take this prayer of meditation and apply it to our life. What are the ways that we are facing today? What are those sufferings? Do I hear Christ telling me to take heart? Am I going to be like Peter and trust Him and step out, but then get distracted so often as I see this gigantic wave coming my way? And saying, oh, well, I was in the boat. I was kind of safe there, but now I'm walking on this water. And I, <laughs> I was trusting You, Lord, but I thought when You asked me out on this water that it was going to be calm, Right? How often do we think this? And this is how we begin meditating and understanding how God is with us and the love He has for us individually. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church says about meditation, meditation is above all a quest. The mind seeks to understand the why and the how of the Christian life in order to adhere and respond to what the Lord is asking. We put ourselves in the situations of Christ and to those stories that we hear in Scripture, to hear the why and the how of what God is asking us. That's meditation. And then from this meditation, it should lead us to a, what's called contemplative prayer. And contemplative prayer is where we begin, uh, it's also been referred to as a, um, in, in some books as a prayer of quiet. Okay, so we began with talking, we could begin, then we put ourselves in the situation, and now we allow God to talk a little more. The prayer of quiet, we shut up. And listen. <laughs> but we don't like that a lot of times. St. Teresa of Avila would say, Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a clo close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with Him who we know loves us. But in order to know that He loves us, not only do we need to put ourselves in those situations and apply it to our lives and to understand with our mind the why and the how, but we've got to allow our hearts to be changed and to recognize that love as our hearts surge to Him so we ought to allow that invitation and that reminder of that love from, from God Himself. And so He tells us this, He gives, and it's a great gift. Other, then from this contemplative prayer leans to uh, deeper levels of prayer uh, which uh, St. Teresa of Avila who was a great uh, spiritual writer um, a uh, powerful prayer warrior, she would say all, all Christians are called to a mystical union with God. A mystical union. But very few of us make it there. Because as we, as we begin with prayer, we begin with our mouth. Then we go to the meditation with our head. And eventually we go down into the depths of our being, into the heart where we find Christ. And when we find Christ in the depths of our being, when we come to know His love and the union He has with us, and then we radically change our own lives. And we're all called to that mystical union, but very few of us make it. And then from that prayer, she says there's other stages, there's all those extraordinary things that sometimes we think, yeah, I'd like to ele you know, be elevated as I'm celebrating Mass. Here I go, I'm lifting up our Lord, and all of a sudden I start floating up in the air. Yeah, that would be great, right? Some people want it, some people don't, you know? But the more important thing is to know that, to, to be able to enter into that mystical union and to recognizing the depth of the love that God has for us. Now, with prayer, we face various things. We face various obstacles, right? Various temptations. Various distractions. One of the constant things I, I, I think people, when they come to uh, get counsel from the priest, they're saying, Father, I keep having problems with prayer. I can't stay focused. I get distracted. I'm like, welcome to the club. <laughs> I don't think any of us... Um, <laughs> has been freed of those distractions. 
you know? Because um, it takes time to enter in, to slow down our minds from the day. Just think about it. You've had a full day of work or whatever you find yourself doing. And then you sit down and you say, I'm going to give 10 minutes to prayer. And you sit down and you begin praying and you're like, yeah, i got to do this tomorrow. And yeah, that wasn't so great today. Um, yeah, okay. Wow, where did the time go? I was so distracted. I didn't even really pray. What happened? Well, first thing that happened is you gave 10 minutes. That's great that you gave 10 minutes, but it takes a while for us to slow down our minds to really enter into the prayer. Some of us are gifted, and that's wonderful in that sense that we can just shut down and, and you know, just sit down and enter into prayer without any problem whatsoever. But I'd say the vast majority of us take a little longer to unwind. St. Ignatius of Loyola, um, right before the ordination of his candidates for priesthood, he would make them take a 30-day retreat of silence, filled with vocal prayer, even though it's a silent retreat, we still pray vocally, filled with meditation and hopefully contemplation. But as he writes, he says, in this 30-day retreat, it takes the first week to really quiet the soul. So a week of silence it will take to quiet your soul. And so have fun. You're going to go up and be in the work uh, force or be in school or what have you. And you've got to enter in. You've got to try to enter into this personal relationship with God with the 10, 15 minutes you have. And yet here's Ignatius Delilah saying it's going to take you a week to really enter <laughs> in silence without cell phones, without the internet, without television. No, he wasn't against technology. <laughs> they just didn't have it. <laughs> but imagine that. We have to give it up. I, I can think of several times when, just as a priest, I, I go um, and I begin praying and the, the liturgy of the hours of the set times. And inevitably, when I sit down to pray, all of a sudden, Father McDonald's coming by to ask me something, or someone needs to see me, or I need to go to the hospital. And I'm thinking, I just sat down to pray. What's happening? <laughs> Lord, don't you know I just want to pray with you right, you know, pray to you right now? That's it? I just want to talk a little time. But that's the, that's the challenge, right? Uh, we find in our homes, we want to spend a little time in prayer, and inevitably something happens. But we still need to make that time um, with our Lord. Uh, and, and to, again, to kind of be careful, just to not fall into that temptation, not let that temptation take control of us, where we say, all right, we've been in prayer, but all of a sudden we have all these distractions, and I'm thinking about all these other things but to constantly struggle with that. To refocus on Christ. That situation of Peter walking on the water, he was distracted. Here he is entering into a personal relationship with Jesus, beginning to trust, humbling his own pridefulness, thinking, okay, Lord, if you think I can walk on water, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to humbly come out on this water. He lost focus, but then it, in order to not keep falling, falling down further and further into that distraction, that temptation, he has to refocus on Christ. And so when we face temptations, when we face distractions, any of those kind of things in prayer, we need to refocus to Christ. And to hear his words, what little faith you have, what's wrong with you? I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying. Right? And so that's what we do with prayer. We've got to keep trying and entering into that prayer. Uh, to enter through those various stages. To not just be praying vocally, but going eventually into that mystical union with, with our God. Are there any questions? 
thoughts. What's a good rubber? <laughs> Um, for for uh, I would say, what is a good uh, bravery to get for you, for most laity? I would say Christ, what's called Christian prayer, because it's not it's not the four volume, and it doesn't cost as much. First, now now you can get it online, okay. Exactly. There, I was saying earlier to uh, Zachary that uh, there were seminarians in seminary that would be in the pews as we would begin praying morning or evening prayer, and they would just be going down, you know, with their their technology. No, <laughs> their uh, electronic uh, device of uh, some sort with their um, with the liturgy of the hours right there. And then this past priest retreat in, in September, there were, there were three or four priests that had their iPhones and they were praying the breviary on their iPhones. Okay, I personally like the book. I like technology. I have nothing against it. But I like the book because um, uh, with the book I can underline things. I can linger it on a little more and then the, the screen doesn't just turn black as I'm praying it, <laughs> right? Because I'm like, yeah, your time's up. We're going to save energy. I have it right there. And then if I fall asleep as I'm praying, I get the nice little imprints on the face, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, so, but I would say it, it's called Christian Prayer, and it's the one volume of it. It has morning and evening prayer and night prayer. And then outside of that, it has a couple other things. But, but the four volume is a little more... Uh, for the, I guess the uh, um, ones that have a little more time to pray, prayers, the breviary, the liturgy, of the hours, um, scripture. This is again uh, one of the best ways to enter into that into that relationship with God, because it's Him talking to us, showing us that love. Uh, the rosary again is a, is one of the powerful uh, prayers in the church. Why? Because again. It's going to the Queen Mother, to the King, Jesus, meditating upon His life, seeing th things through her eyes. Think of all the times that when she, like when she had the when Jesus was lost in the temple, right? And He says to her, "Did you not know I'd be about my Father's business?" You know, kind of thing. And, you know, I think the average parent would probably at that point tell their 12-year-old, you know, what to do, right? But Mary pondered these things upon her heart. It's like, what? <laughs> Come on now. But she did. And so we begin seeing that mystery of her, the losing of Jesus in the temple and what was going on there through her eyes that took in everything and pondered them upon her heart, upon that mystery. And that's how we look. Who was at the foot of the cross? Mary. What was going on in her mind as the mother who gave birth to Jesus? We begin seeing the cross through her eyes. And, and that's, why we, that's why it's a, a wonderful form of prayer. So you're saying this is praying the scriptures? The it's rosary is. Oh, pardon? The, what? Reading, reading, reading scripture is pray is really praying. Right. If we don't read it, and that's why I say it's really you shouldn't just. I mean, you can because it is it is a love story. It's the best love story ever written. You can read it from page one to the very to the last page, um, but it's sometimes better just to focus on on one of the books in the Bible. And, and, and to read upon that, pray upon it, meditate on it. And, and, and in that, that's what we call um, the kind of divine reading or what's called uh, Lexio Divina. Meditate upon it, contemplating the mysteries and, and allowing that to penetrate our lives, telling us the why and how. Um, so. How much time do you like to spend, let's say, on a, on a paragraph or... Well, because of uh, last year, my St. Paul classes, I was having to go through the letters of St. Paul in a, at a rather fast speed. I would have liked to spend more time 
in that. Um, for personally, uh, I think a good place to start is to find the readings for Sunday. To get the readings for Sunday, look at them on Monday, maybe, or midweek. Read those readings. Pray about them. Enter into that. So that you are, are be prepared for the, the upcoming Sunday. So if you are distracted in that liturgical prayer at the time of the readings, or you have some lector who comes up and doesn't speak clearly, or there's some crying baby or cell phone going off, you know those readings because you've been praying them through the week. And so after you've been praying for that, and then... When, when the priest begins speaking on these readings, giving his homily, you, you might have already been receiving other things, and all of a sudden there might be connections. Maybe not. But you can, at the time, I remember when I was growing up, sometimes if the priests were way out in love field with what they had to say, and not even speaking about the scriptures, a lot of times I would just close my eyes and meditate on the scriptures. Buck does this often during daily mass. <laughs> Only when Father Justin is. Actually, I can see all the women back there. Oh, I can see. There's this little light when you buck out back there. So, so each day you're talking what about thirty minutes there? What do you? It it it, it differs um, from person to person. Um, you know, again, it's what you have to look at your own time. You just look at your day. How much time do you spend sleeping? How much time do you spend uh, uh, reading other things? How much time do you spend working? How much time do you spend eating? You know, If you really start looking at what we spend our time with, are we spending time with God in prayer um, based off the day? Now, we can pray to God throughout our day no matter what we're doing, but are we? And if we are, then when we come to, to for that moment, 10 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, an hour, whatever that time is, we'll be more, um, uh, we'll be ready to enter into that prayer because we've been making our whole day a prayer. And so if we've, if we've disciplined ourselves to do that, like, you know, when I, you know, come down here and, you know, just like, Lord, help me straighten up these chairs just right, you know. Um, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be like this, where I have to have everything just so organized and straight, right? <laughs> Lord, help me not kill Buck, okay? Do we make our day of prayer? <laughs> you know, th those, are the, those are the kind of things. And so then when we, when we actually sit and type, so how much time do I spend in prayer? Well, you know, I'm praying this. For the scriptures, I'm reading the scriptures every day because of Mass. You know, I mean, even when I'm not celebrating Mass, reading the Scriptures, because the Scriptures for the weekdays in the Mass are connected with the Sunday's readings. And so if we paid attention on Sunday and we start going to the daily Masses after that, there's a connection. And we see that. And, and, and so, you know, you just follow along. And so if you want... F further to be enlightened even further from Sunday's readings, you could read the daily readings of, of that following week. And how is that leading into the next into the next Sunday? Is there a connection? Yeah, there is. It's not by, by chance. Um, so re reading the scriptures, um, spending time. I once had uh, uh, someone uh, say that they were they were uh, um, what was it? They were praying the rosary. Um, they decided to begin praying a little more, so they began praying the rosary when they were driving in the car. And uh, the, the priest, um, the person who was saying this was a, a priest responding to them and said, well, what happens when you, don't, when you're, when you spend a day and you don't drive? Said, well, I don't pray the rosary. And so the priest in reply said, maybe you should just pray the rosary, not when you're driving, but by alone. Because if it's only when you're driving and you don't drive that day, then you didn't pray. It's good to pray in the car, but if you're not praying when you're not, you know. I mean, heck, I, I pray when I get in the car. 
with some of the crazy people out there, you know, and, and I'm one of them, you know. I just, I, I remember my mom, I mean, when we were growing up, my mom would always say a prayer um, that would, what's called the, the memorari, um, and we would, it's a prayer, uh, you know, a Marian prayer, and we would just pray that prayer when we got in the car, no matter where we were going. If we were going a mile up the road, we prayed it. If we were going hours on the road, we'd pray it. And that was that was kind of our our our, th our prayer. Um, at night, we would pray the uh, the uh, guardian angel prayer. And my mom even changed the word, she, and I was like, "To uh, ever this day and night be at my side," even though I said, "Well, technically, a day is 24 hours, and so therefore it includes." But you know, so I, my mom messed all of us up because even to this day I'll say angel of God my guardian dear to him God's love and trust me here ever this day and night be at my side and I say it I get it's so um, but but those those are ways to, to enter in, into into prayer and just to block out time like I said it, it sometimes uh, a lot easier we're more adapt to prayer in the early morning more attentive okay I'm a night owl but I know that I'm more attentive in the morning after about six cups of coffee. But I am more attentive. But, but that's just something to kind of, because I've had the full day of distractions if I'm praying at night. And that, that can enter into that prayer versus the morning. I just have my dream if I even remember those. Right? So, so those, are, those are some of the things. Yes. I was going to say, uh, I, I think when I finally really focused on uh, prayer was when I began prayer journaling. And I would tend to do that in the morning, and then I would pick it up in the evening, mm. like with a natural area. Uh, even praying scripture, that seemed to be the, the strongest prayer for me. Well, write down some of the, you know, the insights. I mean, that's always, always good. Um, you know, I write on the side of my Bible, you know, as I'm reading it little notations of something I'm, I've got. Never been really good at journaling, but that's me. Um, but it's a good thing. I mean, my brothers, uh, two of my brothers do that journaling, and they, they like it. Yes, Doc? When you're praying over dinner, what's a, a prayer to say before and after? Everybody? Well, the, the most common prayer that Catholics will say as uh, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Through Christ our Lord. And, and it just, that's what we were uh, trained to say. But, I mean, you don't have to say it. I mean, essentially, what is that saying? Thank you for the gifts through Christ our Lord. That's all we really have to say. We're, we're thanking God through Christ. At the end of, of dinner or, or a meal, say, um, uh, I've got the tail end of it. Um, we give you thanks, Almighty God, for these and all thy benefits, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. I just had the tail end of it. I was like, what is it? I should know this. Um, so that, uh, again, what we're doing there is uh, we're giving thanks again to God for what we just ate, and then we're praying for souls.